So this is going to be our uh, virtual field trip for the Rose AC or the Rose family. Um, I just wanted to preface this very quickly. I had been given some feedback about some of the videos that I had made that a lot of repetition of the plants seems to be evident and I just wanted to let people know that the main reason for that is because the field trip videos are compilations of numerous videos that may have been taken several days apart and so every time I start a video I'll say like this is in this family just so that it's a point of reference for me sometimes they don't all get cut out when I'm you know mashing things together I'm not the best video editor in the world it's not something that I've spent a lot of time learning or working on and so just bear with me I'm going to try and um reduce some of the repetitiveness if that helps people um I do appreciate anybody who has any kind of advice for me when I'm doing these um but this is going to be a good long video with a lot of different rosaceous plants we're going to have some fun with the rose family um given how big the rose family is and how um I mean given how it's a big family but it's not a huge family it's kind of like a moderate sized family um, but it's a very important family, and we have a lot to go over, so we're going to enjoy this. This is one of the ornamental rosaceae. This is a cherry that is grown for its flowers. Um, as you can see, it's got this kind of distinctive cherry bark where it's alternating bands of light and almost reddish brown color. Very prominent, especially on the younger branches. Um, oops, don't worry about that. We'll pick off a stem that has some flowers on it. Um, you can see a couple of very key rosaceous traits. First of all, we have the five petals to the flowers. We have the numerous stamens to the flowers, as you can see um, fairly clearly here. You have that single pistil in the middle of the flower. Why can't I get this darn thing to focus? five petals to the flower. Um, the ovary is inferior, which means the petals of the flower rise above the ovary of the plant. And also you can see a lot of red coloration, particularly in those young leaves. That is due to anthocyanin content. Anthocyanins are part of a class of pigments that contain cyanide molecules. Rosaceous plants protect their foliage and seeds with cyanide compounds. Um, we like the red coloration that it gives the foliage. Some of the um, rosaceae have very red foliage, as you can see on this crab apple. So this is cherry. We also have a lot of crab apples. Some of them have been grown specifically to have very red colored leaves. These leaves are starting to come out quite soon. Um, as you can see here, the edges of the leaves are sawtoothed which is a characteristic of the rosaceae. Here we go. Sawtooth leaf margins. Nice feral crab apple here. Um, one of the ways you can tell it's apple and not cherry is there's a lot of hair on the bottom of the um, young leaves. Apples have a lot of trichomes to them, cherries do not. Um, also the um, petioles of apples lack um, glands, which are very prominent in cherry. Those are major differences between apple and cherry. Once you practice looking at both enough, you'll very easily recognize whether something's an apple or a cherry. Speaking of invasives, we have this multiflora rose. Multiflora rose is a rosaceous plant because it's rose, it's in the rosaceae. You can see the common rosaceous characteristics. Um, it's got the um, very serrate leaves. The leaves are alternate. You can see the reddish coloration from the anthocyanins generated. Um, the reason we have multiflora rose is because a lot of the roses people like to grow ornamentally have more delicate roots than what we can um, accommodate in New England in areas like this. So people will graft the stalk of 
a nice desirable rose if you will onto the roots of multiflora because multiflora is very cold hardy very difficult to kill with disease or pest the problem is it also grows incredibly vigorously so when you graft it the multiflora will send shoots from the bottom from the rootstock and people didn't realize this at first and eventually the multiflora part that comes from under the ground overtakes the part that you want and then it produces seeds and birds eat the fruits and disperse the seeds and you end up with multiflora rose all over the place we've got a small rosaceous plant this is wild strawberry believe it or not um and again you can see those um serrated leaf margins um it's got the reddish coloring to it on the edges of the leaves and it's growing next to an apple which is an even bigger rosaceous plant and here you can see where the graft union is um so this must have been grafted at a fairly young age oftentimes when grafting occurs there's a little bit of um i don't want to say argument but a little bit of a discrepancy between the growth of the bottom part of the graft union and the top part of the graft union so you have a little bit of a like clot here if you will where you can tell that grafting has occurred because these are the same species or very closely related species that are grafted onto each other it's probably not going to cause too much of a problem for the um, union it's just because they're not the same there is a little bit of difficulty think about it if you get a um an organ transplant even if the person has the same tissue type as you you still have to um deal with the um repercussions of having an, a foreign organ in your body. Um, people who get organ transplants generally have to be on some form of medication to suppress the immune response to that foreign organ, no matter how close that organ is. Um, I don't know if identical twins can donate organs to one another, but that's generally not the way it works. And so you have to, same with plants, you type things. And when things are closely related, you have a higher probability that a graft or a transplant um, from one part to another is going to succeed. Here we have Prunus serotina, black cherry. This is one of our native rosaceous plants. Um, and it's called serotina because as you can see, there are leaves right now instead of a um, flower or an inflorescence. So this plant puts out its leaves before it puts out its flowers. You can see a very distinctive appearance to the bark. It's this very light reddish brown with all these white spots going across it. It's a white modeling pattern. Um, very distinct. As the tree gets older, those white modeling um, spots start turning into stripes. So this is some older bark of the black cherry, and as the bark gets even older, it starts to get a little bit thicker, a little bit darker, um, it's a more of a gray, but this is clearly a cherry, it's a native plant, very important for a lot of different species. We've got a strawberry here, which is in the rosaceae. You can see the characteristic rosaceous leaves, um, you can see that you know, it doesn't grow very high off the ground. It's got some fruits forming on it. Um, this is just a job lot strawberry that I bought as a plant. Um, these outer things that look like seeds actually contain seeds. This is a weird fruit where the majority of the pulp grows on the innermost layer. Um, and the ovary wall would actually be on the outside here. It's quite strange. Mm-hmm. Strawberry. It's another member of the rosaceae. Now, the seeds are actually in these little dots. The dots themselves are not the seeds. They're too small for us to really dissect them and look into. But, obviously, the uh, plant has this tissue before the ovaries that produce this fleshy material. So when small herbivores like uh, rodents come through to bite off a piece, a mouse might eat some of this, run off, another mouse will come, do the same. And so not only do you have dispersion from, you know, something that moves around a bit, you have dispersion from something that's, you know, really abundant and you have multiple individuals. And so... For strawberry, you can get pretty far. So this is strawberry. 
um, it's cultivated strawberry. They're delicious. I really like to make um, recipes using macerated strawberries, which is where you cut them all up and you put them in a bowl with some sugar. And what happens is the sugar draws out the moisture from the strawberry and eventually all of the chunks of strawberry and the sugar make this kind of syrupy, delicious goop that you can put on cheesecakes and make strawberry shortcakes with and everything else like that. And it's not just strawberries you can do this with. You can do this with a lot of different fruits. Um, some fruits are probably tastier doing that with. Like, you could probably do it with, like, avocado or apple. Well, apple would be good. Avocado, probably not so much. But... Good healthy snack. Very juicy. But this inner material is just kind of this nondescript, whitish, soft yumminess. Now, we selected strawberry to do a couple of things for us. First of all, wild strawberry never produces a fruit that's this big. There's really no need to. We have actually bred them to produce extra chromosomes. And the reason why these strawberries are so big is because each cell is bigger than it normally would be because it has extra chromosomes. And so the more extra chromosomes we induce these things to produce, the bigger the fruit is going to be. You can have huge strawberries that would never be possible in the wild because it's just not the way they develop in the wild. So this is where polyploidy is very important in the rosaceae. Um, you get some of these really large fruits that are beneficial because we can provide that plant extra nutrients. So, you know, the major reason why in the wild these plants would never do that is they just don't have enough nutrients to um, invest their energy into that. What we do is we give them extra nutrients in their soil and we... Um, protect them against herbivores and things that would otherwise be eating them because plants have to put energy into chemicals to defend themselves against herbivores. If we take away that need from the plant just by breeding the individuals that don't do that, we can make a plant that does what we want. So we make a plant that, um, you know, we select for a plant that produces these large fruits with the stipulation that we protect it from herbivores and we supply it with extra nutrients in its soil so that it can sustain that. And that's how I get these big strawberries. Um, really delicious, really awesome. Um, we've also bred strawberries to bloom outside of their normal bloom time or to bloom multiple times in a year or to be disease resistant. Um, strawberries are a really interesting plant. Um, we're not going to talk about their uh, runners and their spreading habit just because it's not particularly relevant to uh, them in culture, but um, if anybody's ever tried to grow strawberry and seen some of those weird strawberry pots where along the sides are these outcroppings, it's because underground they'll send out little roots that might send up new plants. And that's how they spread through the wild. If you've ever seen wild strawberry um, kinka foil, um, they have like these long strings between little rosettes of rosaceae. Crab apple seedling, rosaceae. Here we have domesticated apple, which is grown for its fruits. These are buds that are starting to expand. Um, they're not precocious like some of the other apple species are. They sent their leaves out. You can see some flower buds starting to form. Um, if a plant's precocious, that means it sends its flowers out first. This is sometimes used in identification of different species within the same genus. For example, willows, um, there is a group that are precocious and there is a group that is known as serotonous. Now, interestingly enough, within the cherries, we have a species called black cherry, which I'm going to show you guys soon. And its Latin name is Prunus serotina, and the serotina comes from the fact that it is serotonous. The leaves emerge before the flowers. And Prunus serotina is the main host plant of eastern tent caterpillars because the eastern tent caterpillar hatches out incredibly early. And Prunus serotina is one of the first native rosaceae to actually leaf out. A lot of the other rosaceae in the genus Prunus, at least, flower first. 
This is apple in the genus Malus. There's not a native Malus. All Malus come from Europe and Asia. I think the same is true for pyrus, which is pear. There are pears in this orchard. We're going to take a look at some of these managed trees. So the first thing you'll know is that these trees are very well maintained. They have this spreading habit, which indicates they're getting a lot of light and not growing in the middle of a forest, wherein they would be growing very stiffly upright like that. They're in an open area. The ground is kept relatively clear around them. They're evenly spaced apart, which is good so that every plant not only has enough space for its branches, but enough space for its roots, and also people can get in and out all around. Now, one thing you'll also note is that the trunks look a lot older than you would expect for the branching, and that's for a couple of reasons. We're about to see something really cool. Um... Apple can be grafted. So notice here how this apple trunk has a couple of things. One, there is this, it looks like a scar running all around the plant. And there's a huge discrepancy between the bottom part of the trunk and the upper part of the trunk. And the reason that's the case is because you can reset apples. So you can take an apple tree, cut off the top of it, and then graft. You join the stem from a different apple cultivar or breed of apple so that you can have that apple grow a different type of apple. So you don't have to put a whole new stem, trunk, and roots in the ground. You can just cut off the top and put something else on it. And you can do this basically an infinite number of times. You can also have a um, trunk where you cut off the top and you put a stick of one cultivar on one side, a stick of another cultivar on another side. It's not recommended, but it can be done. And so apples are produced by grafting because if you take the seeds, the seedling may not produce the type of fruit that you want from it. So there's a lot of evidence of grafting in these apples. And so that's how they maintain this particular cultivar. And so let's say we wanted more of this particular cultivar. What we could do is get a bunch of root stalks so we can grow a bunch of seeds because we want the roots and once those seeds have thick enough stems, you cut the top off and then you would take, you know, a thin end of this and graft it on there. Or if you had, you know, a rootstock of an older tree, you could take a piece of this and graft it on. Um, now, grafting is a little bit more complicated than just cutting a piece off and sticking it on something else. There are um, particulars with when you do it and how you line the different layers of the plant up. But if you follow those, it works. Um, so let's just take a look at some of these other, um, apples. This is the cult of our liberty. See how they differ in their, um, times of leafing out and such. These leaves are far more developed than the ones that we saw over there. There's some golden delicious back there. I think those are honey crisp or something. I forget. There's honey crisp in this orchard. There's something else. I forget what all of them are. There is actually a map to this orchard if people are genuinely curious as to what everything here is. So we're just going to kind of tour the apples. Um, I know I really should have my phone oriented this way to take a wider video, and I apologize that I haven't done that. Um, obviously, my lecture videos are going to be a little bit better quality. One, because I'm not outside where there's background noise, and two, they, um, there's a better way of filming. That's interesting. The stem's a little swollen right there. I don't think that's from grafting. I think that's just um, maybe there's a disease or something. You can see an old rotted fruit from last year. Um, Apples as a plant are fairly disease resistant, but obviously certain diseases will reduce yield and so they're not particularly desirable. These are some younger apples, I believe. Are these apples? They have the characteristic buds of a rosaceous plant. Um, let's go find the pears. Are these the pears? I think these are the pears. 
I think this is pear. There's a fly on it. We have Bartlett pears growing in here. All right, so these are two pairs. They're different cultivars of um, a pyrus, pyrus species. These are, um, of course, in the rosaceae, the rose family. And so rose and apple have a type of fruit called a palm fruit. So what we're going to do, is we're going to set these here for a sec. And so palm fruits have this outer covering to them here and then this fleshy inside and so we're going to take cross sections of these in two different directions so we have the um, sagittal section here so we cut it in half this way and you can see that there is the um, core here where the seeds are held in chambers notice how um this is the transverse section it's five chambered remember that the um, plant had a five petal flower being part of the rosaceae we can take a peek at the seeds so here are some seeds from our pear now these would probably need to stratify before um they actually germinate, which is a straightforward process. Um, they would certainly need to be grafted if you wanted to get any um, viable uh, pears from the seedlings. But that's easy enough to do. You could literally um, track down the tree that this pear came from if you really, well, not the exact tree, but maybe the same cultivar. And you, you track down the tree. And um, at East Farm, we have uh, pears growing if anybody ever wants to do some um, pear grafting. We'll get these a uh, couple of seeds out of here, and um, maybe we can stratify them. And, oh, these are a little bit of a different color, but anyway. So, you see we have this uh, five-chamber core here that holds the seeds. This is really satisfying actually. My roommate can have the uh, extra pear flesh because she apparently likes pears. I don't like the taste of pears, honestly. Ooh, I think that seed is uh, that seed is inviable. So they'll produce more um, ovules than they can actually make seeds. So you'll get some underdeveloped inviable seeds um, that's perfectly natural for the plant to do. You can see another one there. It started to make the seed, but then it kind of just got rid of the embryo that was in there. It happens. It's part of um, it's part of the way they develop. You know, it's a plant that will produce, you know, many hundreds of fruits in the same plant. It doesn't need every last ovule to develop into a seed in order to be successful at making new plants. I just kind of dig through the pulp to the core to get any seeds out. And they're not all going to be uh, viable. But the thing is, um, it's a palm fruit. You can see this uh, kind of fairly even kind of tough texture. It's not mushy inside. A lot of large mammals would be responsible for dispersing the fruits of this type of plant. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen a deer eating an apple, but that's kind of how one of the ways apple seeds get spread around. So we're going to do the same with the uh, closely related apples. Um, so apple and pear actually used to be in the same genus. They are no longer in the same genus. Um, apple is in the genus Malus. It used to be known as Pyrus malus, but now it's malus domestica, which is this uh, domestic apple, and it's several hundred cultivars 
that we've bred. This happens to be Macintosh. Macintosh and Macown are actually very closely related cultivars. One is the parent of the other. I forget which order it was, but one of them was crossed with a different cultivar to produce the uh, either Macintosh or Macown. I think Macintosh is the uh, hybrid cultivar, something like that. So we'll cut these two different ways. I damaged the seed, but that's okay. So let's get this one cut the other way. How do you reattach a finger? Just kidding. Okay. So again, just like the pear, you have this poem where there's this outer covering. The inside is fairly even in its uh, consistency and color and texture and whatnot. It's got this kind of toughened, it's not mushy soft, but it's also not totally tough um, texture. It's got this kind of five chambered core in the center. Um, which corresponds here. So this is where the petals were when the apple is actually a flower. It's actually really cool to watch an apple uh, blossom turn into an apple. And this is what it looks like from a different cross section. Again, very similar to the uh, pear. An apple they used to keep the doctor away. There's something off about this, but it could be because I cut it with the same knife I used to cut the pear, and I don't like the taste of pear. I hope I'm not making people too hungry. My apologies. The um, pear seeds that I just extracted sink in water, which is good. It means they're viable. So I'm going to let them sit in the water overnight. Let any juices from the pears rinse away from them. And then we'll get to stratifying them. So, let's shift to a different subset of the rosaceae that produce what are known as stone fruits. So, this is known as a droop. And we're going to see another droop later. But um, this droop is quite special. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll cut this open. Oh yeah, okay. So it's got this kind of softer flesh on the inside. Um, this is Prunus domestica. It's basically a very enlarged cherry. Um, I wanted to get apricot or peach to demonstrate this, but prune is just as good for it. Um, or plum, sorry. Um, so it has this pit on the inside. Not Brad Pitt, just a pit. And this is not actually a seed. In order to get to the seed, we have to kind of crack this thing open. And I'm really hoping we don't damage this if I try this. Okay, so what we want to do the best way to get this, um, like with cherries, you can just kind of put it inside here and you'll get the uh, thing cracked without damaging the seed. But this is a little bigger, this may be a little difficult. I don't recommend um, having uh, any kind of tough tweezer tools in your hands with a slippery wet seed at um, almost 3 in the morning, but I can do it anyway. Okay. So this, oh, it's like not gripping very well. So this hard coating is meant to allow for this to pass through the digestive tract of an animal without harming the seed on the inside. And then this would sit in the ground and kind of rot away for the rest of the summer because a lot of these plants drop their, uh, the prunus will usually drop their fruits fairly early 
um, and then the seed would be exposed to the water and it would stratify. Now, if you want to grow this a little bit more quickly, you can get the seed out of this pit first so that the only thing you have to do is hydrate it and um, then go uh, stratify it. You know, you put it in the fridge. Okay, let's see. So I started to crack it open a bit. Um, I'm trying to be tender with it so I don't actually like crush the seed on the inside because I've done that enough times. But this is a, it's a very, very tough pit. It's really hard to break through. Oh, I'm gonna make a breakthrough! Yeah, there are a couple of things I don't want to happen when I'm doing this. I don't want to slip and then have like my finger get pinched. And I also don't want to grab so far up the center of this that if it gives way and crushes, it damages the seat on the inside. And one thing you can do if you're careful enough is to kind of just give it a couple of squeezes like this to just kind of break away at it without really opening it. But you gotta be so careful with this. In case anybody's really curious, my um, phone right now is being held in place with a uh, dish drainer. You know, one of those drying racks that people have near their sinks after they do their dishes. I should like hire somebody to do like a behind the scenes for me. I'll pay them back in rosaceous fruits. Let's see. We got a chunk of it away. Ooh, we have a window into the seed. Hello there, seed. It doesn't look like I've damaged it yet. We don't want to damage this child. But now it should be easy to kind of break away the rest of this. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna do this carefully though. And yes. So you can see that seed that's in there. I'm going to see if I can try to get it fully out. It's easier said than done. The more of this outer covering we can get away, the better. Although I don't really want to harm that seed. Be running on that road, be running up that hill, be running up that building. Keep weakening that um, outer layer of this. I wonder if I can just like hit it a few times now.
I really wish I could just like had like a laser cutter or something so that I could just very quickly get this open. I wonder if they sell that on Amazon. Now, it's also starting to, like, get a little drier now that it's been in my warm, crummy hand. And, um, that might be making, kind of, gripping this a little bit easier. All right, so I managed to get the stone open. So you can see, this is the actual seed that's inside of that pit. The same applies for uh, cherries and uh, peaches and apricots and things. So this is the actual seed. You can see the veins, the cotyledons there. We're gonna put this in the water, see what happens. Oh God, it sinks. So we'll let that hydrate with the other seeds. That probably needs to be stratified, but I'll double check on that. Uh -huh. So yeah, this is a droop. There's a single seed in there, so it's not really a berry. And the seed is in a centralized location, a special compartment. If you were to feel this, there's a little bit of a tougher layer around that pit than the surrounding tissue there. Um, so that's the stone fruit. It's rose. All right. So we have apple cider vinegar which is made with apples, and apples are in the rosaceae. What they do is they basically ferment the apples almost like you would to produce alcohol, except they allow it to go a step further to produce acetic acid. Um, so you go from a um, an alcohol to an organic acid through a series of complicated chemical reactions to produce apple cider vinegar. It's not a very strong acetic acid solution, as you can see. It's 5% acidity. Um, I don't know what percentage acetic acid that would be, roughly. Probably about 5%. I think that's what they mean by 5% acidity. That does not mean that it has a pH of 5. It probably has a pH closer to 3 or 4. Anyway, um, one of the very important members of the rosaceae is the almond, um, otherwise known as prunus dulcus. Yes, it is actually related to the cherries. It is a type of cherry. Um, just like cherries, the fruit is a droop, and it's a stone fruit. The droop doesn't have a lot of flesh around it, and almond is um, a lot narrower than most of the um, other stone fruits that we use. We actually use the seed of almond, not the um, fleshy fruit material. You can make milk out of almonds. You can eat the almonds themselves. You can make all sorts of extracts and flowers and other materials out of almond. Um, very important for a lot of different uses. People make um, a lot of things that incorporate almond or almond extract. It's got kind of that bittery flavor to it that a lot of people use for various things. It's because of a minute amount of cyanide in the almond seed that all the rosaceae have. It's not enough to actually harm you. You'd have to eat a whole bunch of almonds or extract a lot of material from a lot of almonds in order to actually get sick from the cyanide content. It's not a very high amount at all. You know, most poisons, it's the dosage that matters. So, that's almond. You can see the picture here. Typical rosaceous flower that is an almond flower. Um, you can see the leaves. I don't really think almonds do particularly well around here. I don't think they would die. They just don't um, grow particularly readily. There's a huge almond growing operation out in uh, California. Now, 
we won't get too much into it, but almond growing does pose some problems, particularly for um, bees, because the almond growers have um, beehives shipped out to them every year for pollination, and the whole process of moving bees across the country, bringing them into a pesticide-ridden monoculture, essentially, of almonds is taxing and can promote disease between different beehives and even diseases that cross from the um, honeybees to the native bees all over the place, and that's causing a lot of problems. But almonds are still a major economic activity, so there are good and bad things. All right, so here is an aggregate fruit within the rosaceae. Um, this is blackberry. Now, each of these is its own fruit that has its own seed inside of it. And um, it's in the large genus Rubus, which contains all of the brambles. And blackberries are pretty versatile and pretty useful for a number of different things. But the way you can tell the difference between blackberry and a raspberry is... The raspberry is hollow on the inside because this um, attachment point from being on the plant um, peels away from the ripe um, raspberry, but not the ripe blackberry. So that's how you can tell if you have a black raspberry or a blackberry, because there are black raspberries and there are normal red raspberries. Um, and you can see we've exposed a couple of the seeds in here. So each of these is its own little droop. So each little um, miniature uh, fruit in this aggregate has one seed in it, just like the uh, cherry and um, some of the other uh, stone fruit types of rosaceous plants in the strawberry. So it's not botanically a berry. We call this a raspberry and we call these strawberries. They're not botanically berries the way that blueberries and bananas are. Um, but yeah, here are the seeds. Um, there's really no need to grow um, brambles from seeds. They root very easily from cuttings. Um, and so clonal propagation is the best way to go with these. Although if you're genuinely curious, you could take some of these seeds and grow them out fairly readily. Um, because of the time of year that um, brambles bloom and set out fruit, they probably don't need much of a stratification. This is just satisfying. Here, I know that you guys are young, and so we'll do a smiley face because you guys can't be here to enjoy and experience this. And we'll give it like a tongue, and then we'll give it like a couple of nostrils. It has extra nostrils because it's like not a spider where it has extra eyes. It, it just has extra nostrils because it, it just does. All right. So if we're going to stratify the seeds, what we want to first do is get some paper towels. You can use a bag or a rigid container like these plastic containers. I find these are a little bit more handy. We'll take some water. We'll put just a little water on each of these. We want them to be moist, but they don't need to be stopping wet. So we've got our pre-soaked seeds. We'll take our seed and we're just going to put it on our paper towel and we're going to cover that. So we got our pear and plum. Um, I'm just going to quickly spritz the blackberry seeds with some rubbing alcohol just to really make sure that that um, goopy fruit material is off of them. Just going to gently blot them. Oh, yeah. Okay, guys. So now they should be ready to put in our little cup here. Get in there.
and then these will just go in the fridge for several weeks and then they should germinate all right we have a bramble so brambles have these woody canes that go up and then arch back down now brambles will actually root at these tips once they hit the ground to produce more Bramble is the collective name for everything in the genus Rubus, which includes your blackberries, your raspberries, pretty sure gooseberries, wine berries, things like that. And um, this is probably just a feral wild individual. We have a whole bunch of native species around here. Um, it's not um, Rubus alleganiensis, which I think is the blackberry or one of the blackberry species. And you can tell because the um, stem of alleganiensis would have a very... Uh, pencil-y kind of geometric shape and this is perfectly round this is probably black raspberry because there's a lot of it around um and of course these are dispersed by birds the bird will eat the aggregate fruit and then you'll get the seeds dispersed by the birds as they go around this is spirea this is one of the um japanese types of spirea that has the um pink inflorescences it's grown as an ornamental the members of the genus Spirea tend to bloom later in the season. Our native ones are fall bloomers, really good late season pollinator resource. And as you can see, like all the rosaceae, you can see the anthocyanins, which are evident as the red tinging along the edges of the leaves, particularly the younger leaves. And the leaf margins are uh, serrate or sawtoothed. So this is an ornamental spirea. We have a lot of native spirea around here as well. Spirea really like wet soil. Our spireas that are native here are wetland plants. All right, so our final rosaceous plant is this guy right here. It's just starting to break its bud. Um, this is known as downy service berry. It's one of our native rosaceous plants. Um, it looks very much like cherry, especially when it um, leaves out. The leaves are a lot more rounded than cherry. It's hard to explain exactly how they're different until you actually see the leaf fully out. So we're not gonna worry too much about it. The buds are also a bit different than cherry. They have more um, hair to them. That's why it's called downy service berry. Um, you can see that really nice layer of fuzz over those expanding leaves. Good food for tent caterpillars, just like the cherry. So that's another native rosaceous plant.